This day we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's good to be back with you this morning. We were gone last week. Kim and I had an opportunity. I think most of you know our daughter is a collegiate golfer, and we like to watch her as often as we possibly can. So last week she golfed in Indiana on Saturday, and then she golfed in Indiana on Monday, and we thought, we're not going to drive all the way back, and then drive all the way there, and then drive all the way back. So we actually got the great privilege of going and uh, attending Kylie's church with her. And she had let us know in advance that she has some older ladies that kind of think highly of her, and she wanted us to, in, to be introduced to them. In fact, one of the ladies, her name's Joanne, she said, hey, when your parents come out, I want you guys to come over for lunch. So we got the opportunity to not only go to church with Kylie, which was a great experience, but also to go to Joanne's house, and she made us a meal And uh, we got the opportunity to fellowship together, and it was just a very, very blessed time. Uh, Joanne is 78 years old, uh, and, uh, and yet she is serving the Lord faithfully. She still teaches Sunday school uh, at the church, and uh, again, she, she invited us over, took us in. In fact, toward the end of our time together, she's like, here, I want to show you uh, the, the quilts that I have in this one room, and so she takes us back, and she shows us her quilts, and she told Kylie, she's like, listen, you are welcome to stay here anytime. You can come and you can go as you please, uh, but I just want you to know this can be your room whenever you stay here, and, uh, and, and Kim and I, we were, we were like, wow, you know, this lady has taken, it feels so good as parents whenever someone cares for your children. Uh, there's something special about that, and And I brought this up largely to say this, if you have become one who is in the habit of attending church, I encourage you to get out of that habit. I encourage you to be more than a church attender. Her husband, Joanne's husband, died a number of years ago. Uh, Before he died, many years before he died, uh, they purchased a piece of land and On that land, there was a house, but what they eventually did is they gave that land to the church, and I was like, wow, that's pretty impressive. They established a habit of being more than an attender, and then her husband was involved as a trustee, and her husband was involved in numerous, numerous different ways, and then he passed away, and she kept serving. I was so humbled by that, I was so inspired by that, that I wanted to come back and say to all of you, like, don't just be an attender, invest in someone's life. And you know what else is neat? So Joanne's 78 years old, Kylie's 19, and they have a connection. Sometimes we have this idea that somebody has to be exactly like us. They have to be our, the same age as us. They have to have the, the, same, the same type of personality. They have to go to the same places, like the same things. No, they just need to be alive and breathing, and you can love them. I'm serious. I'm serious. You see somebody walk in, and this was such a blessing to us. Uh, Kim had done some research. You know, when she went to Indiana, we wanted her to find a good church. So Kim had done some research, and she said, hey, I think this is going to be a decent church. And she walked in, and it was reasonably full, and this older lady, they describe themselves this way, by the way. I'm not calling them older. They they call themselves older. Uh, They're like, we have a whole row of us. But this lady, Sharon, she saw Kylie come in, and she's like, come on, come up and sit with us. So Kylie got to sit with the group of old ladies, and now all of these old ladies love her. And we think that it's just great. Kylie called us afterwards, and she was telling us about this, and I said, listen, Getting hooked up with old people is the best thing ever. <laughs> older folks love you better than anyone else. I'm telling you, when, when I went to college, I had this older family kind of adopt me. Man, they treated me good. So I'll say this. If you are older in here and you get to decide who you are, <laughs> I encourage you to look for some of the younger families. I encourage you to look for some of the teens You know, Pastor Alex didn't say anything about this, but uh, he and the teens got the opportunity to serve yesterday. 
Uh, and they just got the, the chance to go to a family's house, and do mulch for them, take care of some landscaping. Uh, Michael was kind enough to send me some pictures, and I was so encouraged. I said to Kim, I'm like, that is, I, I love that, serving together. So all that to say this, don't just come in here and look at me and look at the worship team and then walk out and go about your business. Look around, see if there's someone you can love. See if there's someone you can encourage. See if you can someone that, see someone and, and you can just brighten their day with a smile. Grandma Kay over there, I know that Pastor Alex is so appreciated. Like he, He's like, she, says, she just says that I'm her grandson. And, I, and I'm like, that is pretty cool, isn't it? And so he appreciates that a ton. All of us can have that heart of compassion. We can look for someone to encourage. And uh, I'd encourage you to do that. I got... I'll get into the word here in just a moment. I got the opportunity on Friday to go back to Pennsylvania. Most of you, many of you know, uh, we ministered in Pennsylvania for 13 years. And one of my former students is now a teacher at a Christian school. She reached out to me a number of months ago and she said, hey, would you come and do this retreat for us? And I said, well, I got to see what Kylie's golf schedule looks like, but I would love to do that. And so the golf schedule is she golfs Monday and Tuesday of this next week. So we drove to Pennsylvania late Thursday night. We drove back yesterday. We're going to drive to Indiana this afternoon. But I'm like, I would love the... And, and so I walk in to this retreat and I saw Caitlin. And Caitlin's the, the student that I had. And we've had a special bond ever since I was out there. Her family let us live on their property uh, for the first, I don't even remember how many months uh, that we were out there till we found a home. Again, just generous people. Uh, she taught me how to ride a horse. Uh, I, I had this thing when I first became youth pastor that I just offered to do chores with all the teenagers. I said, hey, whatever chores you have, I will come and do them with you. Well, a lot of the teens didn't have chores, but she lived on a farm, so she did. And I got to clean horse stalls with her. It was great. But anyway, I walk in uh, to this retreat, and in addition to her being there, there was another gentleman uh, who I hadn't seen in probably eight and a half years. Uh, there was another lady. Uh, she's getting to be an older lady as well. One of her, daughter, her daughters was in our youth group, and I walked back. I didn't even know, she, I didn't know any of these people were going to be there other than Caitlin, and I walked back, and Christine was back there, and she was serving, and uh, she said, somebody take my spot. I am talking to this guy. I'm not doing this anymore. Uh, but it was so sweet to see her. And I, I mention all of this to just build on that point. It is such a privilege to invest in the lives of people. And those investments, sometimes you don't understand all that they have in the moment. Uh, you might be investing in some children in the back and... You're like, man, oh man, they are ornery. I don't know if I'm even getting through to them. But then, you know what, you, you might see them kind of like last night at promenade. You know, maybe you see them walk uh, for, for prom. Or maybe you see them later teaching Sunday school. Or maybe you get the privilege sometime to go back and to see one of the students you had Maybe they get to stand up here and maybe they preach or maybe they teach or maybe they do something like that, but invest in the lives of people. It is worth it. I was so, I've been so filled up. We've been running at a really fast pace to get all of this accomplished, but I am so filled up because of people. So again, look around, see if there's someone you can love, see if there's someone you can encourage, someone that you can build a relationship with that at last... Not just a day, not just a week, but it lasts a lifetime. One more thing before I move on, because I see both of these people right now. Three or four weeks ago, right back there, I saw Joe Overby over here walk up to Jillian. And uh, Joe, I won't ask you how old you are. You don't need to tell me. But Joe is older than 32. Um, <laughs> am I right about that, Joe? I'm correct. She's older than 32. And uh, she had her hair dyed, and it's starting to fade at this point. But it was, and I loved it. I loved it. It was a nice blue color, had some pink on the top. She walked up to Jillian, who also had her hair dyed. Uh, and I think it, yours was pinkish at that time, or did it have some blue in it as well, I think? I can't remember. Um, but they walked up, and they had a connection. 
And I saw this taking place, and I was so encouraged in my spirit to see that this connection of someone who, how old are you, Jillian? You're allowed to say, 13. Someone who is 13 connecting with someone who's older than 32. <laughs> see how, see, I, I know, I know. Build into the lives of people. It will pay dividends. It's one of the things I think that makes Northwinds unique, is that we tend to genuinely love each other. But let's love each other more and build more and more relationships. All right, so we're in John 17. I figured since we were at one combined service today, that if the people that come to the 9 o'clock didn't walk out at 1015, and the people that come at 11 o'clock, they're not used to walking out till 1215, I figured we had some extra time today. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. My wife is looking at me. Listen, we had this conversation a number of weeks ago about this. <laughs> John 17, John 17. We're going to be reading verses 11 through 19. So we've already had two messages in this series. I really appreciated Pastor Kirk last week preaching out of Luke 24. Uh, picking up where I had preached a, a previous portion of Luke 24, and then he preached the remainder. So thank you for faithfully preaching and teaching God's Word, brother. I always enjoy that. John 17, starting in verse number 11, this is Jesus' extended prayer. And we read this. Jesus says, I will remain in the world no longer. But they, talking about his disciples, they are still in the world. And I am coming to you, talking to his Father, and then he says, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. The name you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. I'm coming to you now. But I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them, sanctify means to set them apart, sanctify them by the truth, your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world, for them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. This morning we're going to look at what I see as the three main requests that Jesus makes regarding his disciples. I'll give you the three of them, then we'll teach our way through it. The first one, he prays for their protection. The second one, he prays for their joy, that they could have the full measure of his joy. And then finally, he says, I pray that they would be sanctified. So protection, joy, and sanctification. Let's look at the first request the request for protection. I would imagine that many, if not most, maybe even all of us, have prayed a prayer of protection at one point or another. We send our child off to kindergarten, and we pray for their protection. They get their driver's license, and we pray. Oh, I, I should back up. Hold on. They get their learner's permit, and we pray for our protection. <laughs> they get their driver's license, we pray for their protection. They go off to college, we pray for their protection. Many times we will pray even for parents. We will pray for friends that we know that are traveling. We pray prayers of protection somewhat frequently for friends, family members, or even those that are part of the church family as well. But, and this, this should probably come as no real surprise, Jesus isn't praying a prayer of physical protection. He's praying a prayer of spiritual protection. And I find it interesting, and you can see this 
right as we began, this is verse number 11, as he prays this prayer of spiritual protection, he says, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, why? So that they may be one as we are one. The result of this prayer for spiritual protection is unity. Now, if the result of spiritual protection is unity, then I think it's an easy inference to say that one of the areas of strongest attack upon the life of a Christian and upon the life of a church is going to be that of division, strife, quarreling, nitpicking, bitterness, preferences, and the list could go on and on. Anything that Satan can use to divide the body of Christ, Satan will use in an attempt to divide the body of Christ. And make sure you understand what I heard there. Satan cannot divide the body of Christ. He can attempt to do it, but the only way it happens is if we divide the body of Christ. Satan has no power over the life of a Christian. You need to understand that. You can allow him to influence you, but you shouldn't. But he has no power in and of himself. He cannot exercise authority in your life. He can't. He can tempt you, yes. But he cannot exercise authority in your life. You fall under the authority of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Creator of the universe, the one who showed while he was walking the earth that he had power over all demonic forces. He had power over Satan. He had power over every measure of evil. That's the one whose authority you as a child of Christ fall under. Do not listen to the other voices that are trying to draw you away from Christ. Satan would love to divide, but he can't do it without your help. But again, if the prayer of protection is actually a prayer of unity, we need to be aware that there are going to be attacks that come to try to divide us. Romans chapter number 15, verses 5 and 6, we read these words. It says, may the God who gives endurance, this is Paul writing to the church there in Rome, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a what? A spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus. Why or what's the result? So that with one heart and one mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. If unity is going to bring glory to God, then rest assured that the enemy wants to bring strife and division in the body of Christ. We bring God glory, and we know that that's our main pur purpose in life, right? Our main purpose in life is to bring Him glory. I said before, my favorite verse in the Bible is John 10.10. 10. You know that by now. My life verse, I want to be... A verse out of John 17, John 17, 4. Jesus says, I have brought you glory on the earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And so we find out here in Romans 15 that we bring him glory by having a spirit of unity among ourselves. So that we speak with one heart and we speak with one mind and one mouth. And we speak the words that glorify God. Our Savior, 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, the church is described as a body. When all the parts are functioning together in a body, it's a nice thing, right? I mean, when they aren't functioning so well, and I feel like, I, I, I was talking to somebody recently, I said, I don't know how I got 80-year-old knees. I just don't know how that happened. But, uh, but when the body is functioning well together, it's a beautiful thing, but imagine that you woke up this morning and your eye said to your hand, I don't think I need you anymore. Well, eating cereal with your eye would become a real problem. That would be, I mean, how would you go about doing that? You need all parts of the body, and so 1 Corinthians chapter number 12 talks about the beauty of the body of Christ as it functions together. But it doesn't just talk about the function of the body as it 
works together. It also talks about the dysfunction of the body. When the parts of the body turn against each other, rather than productivity, we find impotence. We find a lack of power. We find uselessness. So if you will, just real quickly, 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, I'm going to read just a couple of verses. Verse 18 says this, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. God has arranged every single part exactly as he wanted it to be. I began this morning by talking to you about the challenge of being more than an attender, but actually being involved, looking around, seeing someone that you can love, show compassion to, all of those things. God has put you in the body for a reason. Verses 25 through 26 say this. It says, there should be no division in the body. But its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Anytime we see someone who's struggling, anytime we see someone who is rejoicing, we rejoice with those who rejoice, we weep and mourn with those who mourn. I'm currently weeping with Tiff. I just am. Oh, man, if you don't know this, she has to have this surgery done that's going to cause her to, she can't talk for four days. <laughs> Tiff and I are kindred spirits when it comes to talking. That's tough to not talk for four days. And then how long can't you yell? Six months she can't yell. I genuinely feel, I, I, I kid you not. Have you seen Tiff at sporting events? How many of you have seen Tiff at a sporting event? To see Tiff at a sporting event is to love Tiff at a sporting event. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're going to be praying for you. And if you need me to say something, you just write it down. But there are others. There are others who we know they're going through a rough time. We know that they're going through challenges in their life and what do we do just kind of turn a blind eye and pretend that they don't they don't exist at that that tough time no we're unified it's they're part of our body you say well i haven't been here all that long it doesn't matter you're part of the body of christ we want to love you we want to show you compassion we want to lift you up encourage you that's what we want to be able to do that's how the body should function i believe that one of the attractive things about Northwinds Church is the unity that we have and the love that we have for each other. Now, we've said before that unity is hard. We have to keep working at unity. Unity is not a constant. It is not something that you say, okay, well, I talked about getting a driver's license er earlier. It's not as if you say, I have unity. Therefore, for the remainder of the time we are a church, we will always have unity. It doesn't work that way. We have to work at unity. But for the six and a half years that we have been Northwinds Church, the amount of unity, even through times that were divisive for the rest of the world, we remained united here. It was a beautiful thing to see, but it has to continue to be our focus. We have to continue to strive for unity. Because honestly, it only takes a couple of people to stir up division. Did you hear what they're planning to do? Did you know that they're going to spend this amount of money on whatever it might be? I'd never do that. What good is any of this going to do? Why, why are we hiring a youth pastor? By the way, I never heard that. <laughs> Literally never heard that. So I, I like to use illustrations that I haven't heard because then if I use illustrations that I have heard, then it's like I'm picking on you, right? <laughs> Literally never heard that. I think everybody here cares about our students and I'm loving seeing them grow together. I'm loving seeing them serve together. Uh, all of those things, they're just going to continue to grow and grow and grow uh, in their walk with the Lord and their walk with each other. It's a great thing, but it only takes a little bit of time to cause division. You'll probably be a little bit surprised about what Paul writes to Titus. Titus is not a book we turn to very often. It's kind of a small book, but turn to Titus. It's just a couple of books before Hebrews. 
only a couple of pages before Hebrews. And if you've been here any amount of time, your Bible ought to just flop to Hebrews anyway. But in, in Titus chapter number 3, verses 10 and 11, here's what Paul writes. He says, warn a divisive person once and then warn him a second time and after that have nothing to do with him. Wow. That's some pretty in, intense and intentional language there. Why? Because in Jesus' prayer for protection for the church, he knows that unity is going to be under attack. And so Paul writes and he says, listen, warn them once, warn them twice, and then don't have anything to do with them. It goes on and it says, you may be sure, verse 11, that such a man is warped and sinful. He's self-condemned. Now here's, here's the thing. Here's what I want to make sure you hear. Unity does not always mean agreement, okay? So you might have a different thought about something than the person you're sitting beside, but you can still be unified. Husbands and wives, I'm going to ask this question. Any husbands and wives root for different sports teams, like clearly opposed sports teams? Okay, we have some over here. You guys are Browns and Steelers, right? All right, so clearly opposed. And yet you can have unity in your marriage, except on Sundays. <laughs> except on Sundays. No, you can have unity even through that. Uh, I have often said, uh, this is kind of terrible, I said if Kim was a Browns fan when I met her, I probably would have never considered dating her. Uh, but <laughs> it's a true story. It's a true story. But I've grown since then, and now I've, I, I've grown to appreciate that if everybody was a fan of the same team, how boring would that be? That would be really boring. <laughs> or fun, I don't know. <laughs> but we can have differences of thought and opinion and still be unified, right? And so that's okay, that's okay. It doesn't mean we all have to think exactly alike. Uh, our marriage uh, life group, which actually we're having... Uh, one of our life group sessions, we're going to have a meal together right after this, then we're going to have a life group session. And this session is on conflict. Even if you're not a part of our life group, if you want to come and hear about conflict, go ahead. No, I'm just kidding. We don't have enough food for you. Go home. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. If you don't know me, I, you probably think I'm mean right about now. I'm really not. I'm really not. Um, but unity is important. Romans 16, we we're already in Romans 15, so you're not far away from it probably. Romans chapter number 16, check this out. Paul begins to wrap up his letter here and he says in verse number 17, I urge you brothers to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. So here's the difference between having healthy disagreements, and causing division. Matthew 18 kind of sets the pattern for this, right? If you have a problem, you go to the person you have a problem with. That's called working through conflict. When you have a problem with an individual and you go to someone else to stir up somebody to get on your side, that's caused division. Working through conflict is here. You go to the person that you're having the issue with, or let's say, let's say that we as a church, we make a decision, and you're like, oh, man, I'm struggling with that. I've had conversations with people who have struggled with decisions, and it has been good. It has been productive. That's not causing division. But whenever we go outside of that, and again, this is falling under the umbrella of Jesus is praying for protection. And one of the greatest areas of needed protection in the church, and honestly in our families, in our communities, is unity. We need to have that. So you go to the person or to the entity you have a problem with. You don't go outside of that. When you do that, that's called division. We want to have unity Unity can work through conflict. Division is something that the Lord says, stay away from. Does that make sense? All right, so the prayer of protection here uh, is a prayer of unity. I'm getting close to wrapping this part up, but let me just show you one more thing. Unity does al also does not just take this uh, approach or this philosophy that says, well, just so that we 
don't have conflict, everything goes. So there's no such thing as sin. There's no such thing as right and wrong. There's, there's no such thing. You just do whatever you want to do and it'll be okay. Some people think that there is unity by avoiding any measure of conflict. The Corinthian church, which was one of the most messed up churches that Paul had to write to, they took this approach for a while. In fact, look with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Starting in verse number 1, we read this. Paul writing to the church at Corinth to correct them. He says, it's actually reported, so he's heard about this. It's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. And of a kind that does not even occur among the pagans. A man has his father's wife. And then look at the very next verse. They, it says, and you are proud. So this church was proud. Like, hey, we have no standards here. You just come and everything goes. You married your stepmom? That's, yeah, come on in. Everything goes here. Everything goes. Paul writes and he says, this kind of sexual immorality, that doesn't even take place out there. And you're proud that it exists in the church? What does he go on to say? He says, you're proud. Shouldn't you rather have been filled with grief and have put out of your fellowship the man who did this? Now, this might surprise some of you that Paul would write this and that a church would take this approach. But a church has to hold true to God's word. If a church doesn't hold true to God's word and what he is teaching us, then we cease to be a church. We're just a fellowship of people who anything goes. That's not a church. A church falls under the authority of Christ. Not a single amen. That's okay. That's okay. The church does. It falls under the authority of Christ. And we have a responsibility to preach and teach the word of God. And I would be failing you as a pastor. If I knew that there was sin in your life and I just said, eh, anything goes. It's all right. No standards here. Do whatever you want. That's, first of all, that shouldn't be what you want in a pastor. And second of all, that's never what you're going to get from me. If I know that there's sin in your life, I'm going to talk to you about it. I'm going to do it lovingly because what do we find? Speak the truth in love. And then we build each other up, right? That's, I think, Ephesians 4. Speak the truth in love. We have to have that. So all that to say this, unity doesn't mean everything goes so that we all get along, everybody does their own thing. No, there is unity around truth. There's unity around God's word. There's unity around a love and a compassion. Yes, come as you are. Everyone is welcome. But we love you too much to just say, ah, anything goes. No, we want to we challenge you to then turn to Jesus and walk with Jesus. And it's with walking with Jesus that you find the true joy, the fulfillment that you've really been longing for anyway. We've all been designed for a relationship with the Lord. And when we're walking in that, we're walking in truth. All right, so that's the first thing. Jesus prayed for protection. It was a spiritual protection. Now, it's interesting. In that prayer of spiritual protection, he prays, protect them by your name, by the name that you gave me. So then you get this question is there power in the name of Jesus? Is there power in the name of Jesus? I would imagine that if I were to ask you if there's power in the name of Jesus, we would get a largely divided congregation. So I'm not going to ask you to shake your head yes or no, is there power in the name of Jesus? I'm going to surprise you probably by the answer I give you. Because I would guess that a decent majority of you would nod your head, yes, I think there is power in the name of Jesus. And I would say that in the name of Jesus alone, there is no power. And before you call me a heretic, let me explain. You ever heard somebody swear? And I can't even say, I can't even bring myself to say it without it being 
an intentional use of the name of Jesus Christ. I can't just say his name in a way that's not giving him honor. There's, so, just in the name of somebody uttering it, there's no power. But what we understand, so those of you that were about to call me a heretic, here's what we understand as a Christian community. The name of Jesus is connected to the person of Jesus. So when we call on the name of Jesus, there is power. Because there is power in the person of Jesus. So somebody just uttering the name of Jesus as they're swearing, there's no power in that name being just uttered. But there is power in the name of Jesus when we call on the second person of the Trinity and we say, I don't understand what's going on right now, but Jesus, 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 I just want you to be present with me. I know that there is power in your name because your name is connected to you as a person. You don't have to express that. We understand as a Christian community that there's power in the name of Jesus because the name of Jesus is a person of Jesus. Does that make sense? So I would imagine that some of you, until I explained that, were thinking, mm, this guy, I can't stand him. <laughs> there is power in the name of Jesus. Because of the person of Jesus. In fact, in biblical times, to invoke someone's name was to invoke that person. Uh, let's use an illustration like this. Uh, I believe that I can be helpful in a lot of situations. So there have been numerous times that people will call on me, right? Hey, Pastor Dave, you think you can help me with this? Hey, Pastor Dave, I have this question. You think you can give me an answer? Hey, Pastor Dave, tree fell down on my fence. Can you cut it up? Hey, Pastor Dave, whatever it might be, I believe I can be helpful in many situations. But if you just, in your own house, without me around, utter my name for no good reason, I'm going to be of no help to you. The name needs to be connected to a person. Now, here's the beautiful thing. Jesus is what? He's omnipresent. He is with us in our homes. He is with us at our workplace. He is with us everywhere we go. So when we call on the name of Jesus, we have the immediate presence and person of Jesus. So whenever Jesus prays and he says, protect them by the power of your name, he's saying, listen, God, protect these people. Every time they call on you, be right there, just as you've always been there for me. When they call on you, and what, what does Jesus say? Many, many, many times again, whatever you ask in my name, it will be given to you. So we have that connection. We have that lifeline. I, I hate to call it a lifeline because that sounds like we only use it in emergencies. You should be calling on the name of Jesus time and time and time again. All right, so he prays this protection, this spiritual protection. One more part of that protection is in verse 15. He says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. What do we know about the evil one? He's like a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. We need to understand that we need the protection of our Savior. We're in the world. We're not of the world. So protect them in the world. Notice that he says, I'm not praying that you take them out of the world. You'd be surprised the number of people that talk, I, I think I need to get a different job. Why? Well, because the people at my workplace, they swear all the time. All right, don't swear. They'll probably see something different about you. Light shines brightest where? In the darkness. So if God has given you the privilege of being around some ungodly people, now let me qualify that. It is possible that in your walk with the Lord, you're at a position where you're vulnerable and you find yourself going into and, and kind of reducing your standards because of them. Okay, then maybe God's desire is for you to be in a different situation till you are strengthened up. But I'll be honest, I have loved and I continue to love the times that God puts me around ungodly people to be a godly influence upon them. So he says, I didn't, I'm not praying you take them out of here, just protect them now. Also know this, his prayer of protection was not a physical prayer of protection. The disciples, the apostles. Let me just kind of read through some of the ways in which they died. 
So Peter was crucified upside down as a result of Nero's persecution of Christians. History says that Andrew was crucified on a cross in the shape of an X. James was beheaded by King Herod. This is actually found in Acts chapter number 12. A lot of it is just through church history. Phil, Philip, he died in Heropolis by being hung. Barth, Bartholomew was flayed to death by knives. And the list goes on for the apostles in the way in which they died. And so we understand that this prayer of protection was not... And think about the apostle Paul. Beaten, stoned, left for dead, ultimately was, was killed. Like... This prayer of protection was, may I not lose a single one, Father, that you've given to me. And my prayer for each one of you is that your faith never fails. I pray a lot of things for my family. But a consistent prayer for my family is, Lord, help them to love you all the days of their life. And help them to serve you always. Yeah, I would love for them to have a safe trip to and from wherever they're going. But I care so much more about their spiritual protection than I do any measure of their physical protection. So make sure you're praying for that spiritual protection for your family as well. Real quickly, because I realize I am running out of time here. He also prayed that they would have the full measure of his joy. Two things about this joy that Jesus gives. Number one, Jesus ties his joy with the things that he has said, the things that he has taught. And we need to understand that the greatest joy is not found in fulfilling our every desire, but it's rather found in walking closely with Jesus and following his teaching. I don't know why John 10.10 just comes up all the time, but it's right there. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I, Jesus, I have come that you can have life and have it to the max, have it to the fullest. Have the abundant life. That's how you have the full measure of his joy is when you're walking with him. The second thing about this joy is a reminder of what Jesus said as he was preparing to leave. What did he say? I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to send you who? I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. I'm going to pray to my Father and he's going to send you the Holy Spirit. Now, if you know the list of the fruits of the Spirit, what do you find? The fruit of the Spirit is love, Joy. And it continues on. The second in the list is joy. As you allow the Holy Spirit to have more and more of an influence on your life, being filled with the Spirit, it's not as if you ever lose the Holy Spirit, but you can be filled or you can be to a large degree empty of the Holy Spirit. You can quench the Holy Spirit. I would encourage you to daily ask for the Spirit to fill you. And as you're filled with the Spirit, what do you do? You have the fruit of the Spirit, the love, the joy, the peace, those things that we all desire. So this joy comes as you submit to the Holy Spirit. The final thing is he prays for their sanctification. Sanctification means to be set apart. I mentioned that earlier. To be set apart and not only set apart, but set apart for a purpose. And what's our purpose? We already mentioned it. To bring glory to God. And so he says, he says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. I mentioned it earlier. In having unity, we can't avoid truth. Truth actually brings light and brings unity. And as followers of Jesus, we understand that, as he says, your word is truth. When I got the opportunity uh, on Friday to speak to a hundred or so students, the thing that I told them, I said, if you don't remember anything else that I say to you, understand this, God's word will guide you all of your life if you'll let him. It really will. The Holy Spirit will use the Word of God all of your life. I'm 45. I can remember at the age of 17 thinking I knew a lot about the Bible. And after, what, 28 additional years of studying the Bible, I feel like I know nothing about the Bible. There's just so much more that He has to teach me. So many more ways in which He has to conform me to His likeness and to His image. I love that He continues to use His Word by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
So lean into the word and you will find yourself being more and more set apart. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for our time together. Thank you so much for the challenge that we have in understanding your prayer of protection is a prayer of unity. So it takes individuals working together as the body of Christ, working in harmony that the eye doesn't say to the hand, I don't need you, that the hand doesn't say to the kneecap that I don't need you, that the feet don't say to the head, I don't need you, but that we say, you know what, let's work together as the body of Christ in ways in which there are attempts to divide us. I pray that you would help us to see through those as what they are and that we would be unified now and forever under Jesus Christ. I pray that you would help us to experience the full measure of your joy as we walk in your truth and as we allow you to teach us and to mold us as we submit to the Holy Spirit and then finally, Lord, help us to be set apart for your purpose, to bring you glory on this earth, to finish the work you gave us to do. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.